hello, hello, hello. How are you, my loves? My name is Audra Sargilis, and this is The Secrets of Sex. By now, you know that this is like not porn. It's literally a historical vlog on everything that takes place throughout history involving sex. So I'm glad you're still here. I love you for it. It means the world to me. If you like what I'm doing here, please do me the enormous favor and subscribe. It helps me out. I am small, I am growing, and I need you. And without you, I couldn't be here. Granted, I don't get paid for this. This is on my own time. But I do love this. It's it's a lot of fun for me. And educational. It's It's been like a whirlwind, right? I, I, I love it. Um, so thank you. Just thank you for being here. That's all I have to say. So we've gone through some things. And uh, so here we are, like, I, I hit the 1960s, right? And I kind of hit a wall. Because I don't feel like there is very much information in the 60s revolving around prostitution. And I don't know if that's because we hit on the like, very beginning of this season of love, the, the summer of love, which is in the 70s, right? Which will hit, but it'll be later because it doesn't deal with prostitution. But I just feel like there is this lack of information. However, you know that I cover serial killers that are sex-based. And since we are in prostitution, I am covering serial killers based off of prostitution. Granted, as we go forward into this rabbit hole that is the secrets of sex, we'll hit many serial killers that I'm sure will be in prostitution, even though that will be out of it by then but it doesn't matter because it's still a sex-based crime. I feel like my damn eyeballs are about to fall out of my head. That's better, okay. You know, girl problems. I swear, some days I'm girl enough for the makeup, some days I'm not. Go figure. Um, if you would like a little bit about me, why don't you leave that in the comments? Leave it in the comments. And um, I'll do an episode of, uh, of About Me, but you have to ask questions if you would like it. So Rachel will be uh, with me on this episode uh, covering it. I love her. I think that she adds so, so, so much to the series and to the channel in general, and it's a lot of fun for me. Corsa will be joining me from time to time. Um, I'm trying to get her on a future episode. I don't know what that's gonna be yet, but she'll be with me as well. You all have met her on my lives, and um, you know, it's either me and Rachel, or me, Rachel, and Corsa on our lives, which I really enjoy, it's a lot of fun. And for some reason, like, we can never keep it under an hour. They're, like, an hour to three hour videos. But uh, that's okay. It's a lot of fun. It's just a lot of fun. So um, we engage and talk to everybody involved. So really, like, that's why they go so long, because we get engagement, which is uh, wonderful. So, again, thank you for that, everyone who has ever 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 um engaged in a live we really it's it's pretty awesome i love you for it thank you so much um so today um i am going well we are going to cover jack the stripper this is not jack the ripper jack the ripper was a long time ago i covered this before in previous episodes if you have not seen it please go back and watch them. 
Originally, this case was called the Hammer Smith Nude Murders, but then later on has been known and to date is known as Jack the Stripper. I have watched numerous um, documentaries on this and also listened to podcasts on this. So again, like I have notes because as I've mentioned before, I'll get better at this, but I do also work 16 to 18 hours a day. <sighs> and right now I don't have time to memorize all of this information. So the Hammersmith nude murders were a compilation of six murders in West London, England between 1964 and 1965. The victims were all prostitutes and were found undressed in or near the River Thames. Thames is spelled T-H-A-M-E-S. You could call it Thames, but to my knowledge, it is called Thames. And this led the press to call him Jack the Stripper. And they were referencing to Jack, Jack the Ripper because of what he did to these women. Two earlier murders committed in West London between 1959 and 1963 have also been linked um, by investigators to this series of murders but they are not like officially claimed. So we have like eight murders, right? That are, are literally um, um, by, by, by police to be Jack the Stripper. Um, di also despite intense media interest, in one of the biggest manhunts in Scotland Yard's history. The case is today in 2022 unsolved. I am going to do a side note at the moment. So I listen to a lot of the podcasts of um, Case File and um, if you have not listened to him, I'm up into the hundred right now and I am literally going to finish this until I am done and a new episode comes out. So I am current. I also listened to Bailey Sarian because she is quite honestly like an icon to me, a huge, huge role model for me personally, even though I am her elder. I just love her. Um, and I actually study both of the both of them very, very closely. So I, I try to do very well and I hope I do so. But oh my God, like listening to all of these stories. If if you're not a crime buff like me or a true crime or a serial killer you know, like involved like I am, which I'm, I'm, I'm pretty involved. But when you start covering this kind of stuff on your own, right? It's pretty disturbing because you really dive deep into this rabbit hole of things and information. And it is horrible. And the lack of, at times, the, 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 the lack of interest or the lack of belief or the, the, the lack of professionality is stunning. I think you all know at this point, you, you know, I'm a true blue, sir. I mean, like true blue believer in the thin blue line. Like 
I believe in the police force and our first responders and um, I support them 100%. But I will absolutely say that there are cases that I have listened to and this one in particular as well, I just feel like things are very lacking. I really do. I, 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 I really believe things are lacking. Now, maybe in this case, because the victims were prostitutes, and I know that through time and then watching the, um, the documentaries and then the, also in listening to podcasts that, you know, they say that it's not the case, but I will say that I don't fully believe it. I just, I, I really don't. And there are times in these things that I literally, when it def definitely when it comes to the serial killer, <laughs> when it comes to the serial killer cases, there are times when I have to put it down and walk away because it is, it's a really rough, sad, it's a sad thing. And this is, to me, this is kind of one of them. Our first Jack the Stripper murder that was documented, not including the 59 and 63 murders, okay, was Elizabeth Fig. Elizabeth was born March 24th, 1938 in Biggington, Cheshire, England. She died June 17th, 1959 at the age of 21 in London, England. The cause of death was deemed asphyxiation due to manual strangulation. Her other names were Anne Phillips and her known occupation was prostitution. I watched, as I have stated, the documentary on this and her children were at home waiting for her. And to this date, her son still is damaged. And of course, why would not he be by the loss of his mother? Elizabeth was found dead at 510 AM on June 17th, 1959. Um, she was found on a routine patrol in Duke's Metal Meadows Chinswick. Again, this is England. I'm sorry, like I'm I'm gonna do my best to like make sure words are correct. Um, she was found on the north bank of the Thames River. All right. Um, the park had a reputation as Lover's Lane, where prostitution was known to take place. A lot of prostitutes took their johns there. It just like kids also in their cars, they would go there and, you know, do what kids do. As we've all done. Um... Fig's body was found on a scrubland between Dan Mason Drive and the river's towpath, approximately 200 yards um, west of Barnes Bridge. Her dress was torn at the waist and opened to reveal her breasts. Marks around her neck were consistent with strangulation. Her underwear and shoes were missing and no identification or personal possessions were found on or around her body or in the area. 
a pathologist concluded that death had occurred between 2 a.m. on June 17th. Um, a post-mortem photograph of Fig's face was distributed to the press and was independently recognized by her, her roommate and her mother. This is where something really bothers me. They, they, they literally had to put this out into the press to find out who she was and her roommate and her poor mother had to identify her instead of being notified. Can you imagine? Extensive research of the area, including the river, riverbed, fell, failed, failed to find Fig's underwear, her black stiletto shoes, or her white handbag. A police official theorized that she had been murdered by a client in his car after removing her shoes and underwear and that these and her handbag remained in the car after her body had been disposed of in Duke's Meadow. The proprietor of a pub on the opposite side of the river where Fig was found said that on the night of her murder, he and his wife had seen a car's headlights in a parked position on the area where her body had been found at about 12.05 a.m. And shortly after the light switched off, they heard a woman scream. And that would be when she died. Now, what's not stated in some research is that on the next day, her her children literally walked in their pajamas to find her. And then they got ready and a neighbor, well, they got ready. So they walked about very early in the morning in their pajamas to find their mother. And a neighbor who knew that she was a prostitute um, saw them and, and was like, no, 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 they, she took them home. She helped them get ready for school and took them to school. And it wasn't until later that, um, they were notified of their mother's murder uh, when her very own mother saw her death in the newspaper. It's very odd. I don't know. I try, I don't know how people do this unemotionally and, and how other, I mean, it's gotta be a practice thing to go through these things and not, um, have any feeling about it. It's very bothersome to me. I, I mean, not to them, not to other people who do this, and obviously they've, they've learned how to do it, but I don't think that's something I ever want to take away from myself or from my videos is the actual and truth behind it. This was a human being, and they were murdered. I find it a sad thing. Okay, so on to victim number two, um, Gwyneth Reese. So Gwyneth was born on August 6th, 1941 in Barry, Wales. She, like all of the ones we're covering, is a, was a prostitute. And with that, she had a few different aliases. Um, Georgette Reese, Tina Smart, and Tina Dawson were some of the names that she used while she was out there, we'll say, meeting new people. Um, so Gwyneth disappeared September 29th, 1963. 
And it wasn't until on November 8th of 1963 that Gwyneth's body was found. And it was found in kind of a weird spot. So she was found at the Barnesboro Council Household Refuse Disposal site in Townsmead Road, on Townsmead Road in Mortlake. Words are very difficult. Um, when Gwyneth was found, she was completely naked except for a single stocking that was on her right leg that didn't go up above her ankle which seems a little weird but at the same time it's also weird that she was found in a disposal site like a refuse disposal site um when they found her she was accidentally decapitated um by one of the workers that was leveling out the disposal site um which damn like not only were you killed and left in a disposal site but now you're decapitated on top of that. Brutal. Um, the saddest part about this, I think, is that she was only 22 years old. Like, she was young and still had a lot of life ahead of her. And what's also really weird about this is her death is still unknown. Nobody knows how she died, any sort of cause, anything. And it'll forever be a mystery. Now we go on to Hannah Tel Telford, 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 T-A-I-L-F-O-R-D. I, I want to say Telford. Anna was born on August 19th, oh, so 1938. She passed on, well, she disappeared in January of 1964. Um, in goodness, heading on the wall, Northumberland, England, at the age of 30. Uh, this would be London, England, and the cause of death that was distinguished was drowning. Her other names were Hannah Lynch, Ann Taylor, and Ann Taylor. So Taylor, T-A-I-L-E-R, and then T-A-Y-L-O-R. And her occupation was of a prostitute. She was found dead on February 2nd, 1964 on the Thames River, right below the Linden House. Uh, that was the clubhouse of the London Corinthian Sailing Club, west of Hammersmith Bridge. She had been strangled, several of her teeth were missing, and her underwear had been stuffed in her mouth. Our fourth victim is Irene Lockwood. So Irene was born on September 29th of 1938. Um, she was also went by a couple of other aliases. Um, she was known as Sandra Russell and Sandra Lockwood, which I think it's kind of interesting and I'm kind of curious how some of these girls come up with what their aliases are going to be. It's kind of cool that for some of them they keep their last name and then others they go with like weird last names. But I'm curious are like are the first names that they come up with are those middle names? Are those just names where like oh I could see myself being a Sandra or I could see myself being a Robin or a Patrice or you know whatever. But it could really be anything. Just have fun with it, you know? Like if I was a prostitute, I'd come up with some pretty cool names for myself. But I digress. Let's go back to Irene. So Irene disappeared on April 7th, 1964. And it's really crazy because her body was actually found the next day. 
Um, and it was found on the foreshore of the Thames uh, mm -hmm. at Corny Reach in Chiswick, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, they found that she had drowned to death. Um, and the real... This is actually kind of devastating because she was not only was she young because she was 25, but Irene was pregnant when she died. Um, I'm not quite sure how far along she was in her pregnancy, but that's a bummer. Like that really sucks. <laughs> like not only are you drowning to death and also being pregnant on top of that, but I'm like, the drowning, was it purposeful? Was it an accident? Like, there's so many unknown questions that we'll never have answers to, which really sucks. Our next victim is Helen Catherine Barthamley. She was born June 9th, 1941 uh, in Ormiston, East Lothian, Scotland. She disappeared on April 22nd, 1964 at the age of 22 in London, England. The cause of death was asphyxiation by strangulation. Her body was discovered in Manor Road, Brentforth. And her her Occupation was that of prostitute. In East uh, Lothian, it was, she was an East Lothian born and found dead on April 24th, 1964 in an alleyway near the 199 Boston Manor Road, Brentford. Her body gave investigators their first solid piece of evidence in the case. Flecks of paint used in car manufacturing were found on her body, and police felt that the paint had probably come from the killer's workplace, right? They therefore focused on their investigation going to tracing businesses that dealt in that. Victim number six. That's not supposed to be kind of exciting. Sorry for that. <laughs> it's not happy that we have victim number six. Um, so victim number six is Mary Fleming. Mary was born on September 16th, 1933 um, in Clydebank, Scotland, which I've always wanted to go to Scotland. I feel like it'd be very beautiful there. Might have to take a trip sometime. But anyway, Mary. Um, she was a prostitute like the rest. Um, and she disappeared July 11th, 1964. Three days later, on July 14th, 1964, her body was found. And it was found outside of 48 Baramede Road in Chiswick, which makes me think, is that just like on the side of the road? Is it like in a field? Baramede Road, hmm. Questions, never have answers frustrating but anyway um when she was found there were paint spots found on her body and neighbors that they had talked to said that they heard cars reversing down the street just before um, the body was discovered so with that it seems like somebody had killed her and then just decided oof toss her out on the road and get out of there um and her cause of death was asphyxiation and strangulation. Mary was, she wasn't as young as the others, um, but she was still young. She was only 30 when she died. Frances Brown is our next victim. She was born January 3rd, 1943 in Glasgow, Scotland. 
She disappeared October 23rd, 1964 at the age of 60 or the age of 21, not 61, the age of 21 in London, England. Her cause of death was asphyxiation by strangulation. Her body was discovered in Horton Street, Kensington. Her other names were known to be Margaret McGowan, Francis Quinn, Anne Sutherland, Donna Sutherland, Susan Edwards, and Nuala Rollins. Her occupation was prostitute. Brown was last seen alive on October 23rd, 1964 by colleagues who saw her getting into a client's car. On November 25th, her body was found in a car park on Horton Street, Kensington. She had been strangled and the colleague was at least able to provide police with um, like a description of the car and, and they were able to actually like give, um, what are they called? I'm having a brain fart. Um, people who do, uh, people who do drawings. Oh my God, brain fart. Anyway, she was able to give a description of the car and they were able to draw the car up. Um, and it was thought to be a Ford Zephyr. What's a Zephyr? I don't know what a Zephyr is. Do you know what a Zephyr is? I've never seen a Zephyr. Anyway, Brown had testified as a witness for the defense, um, along with Chris, Christine Keller and Mandy Rice Davis at the trial of Stephen or Stephen Ward. You know, their names are a little bit different there, but Stephen is always very oddly pronounced. So it's either Stephen or Stephen Ward in July of 1963, although it absolutely had nothing to do with this trial because this has never been solved. Victim number eight, Bridget O'Hara. So Miss Bridget was born March 2nd, 1937 in Dublin, Ireland. Yeah, bring on the Irish. So Miss Bridget uh, disappeared January 11th, 1965. And they found her dead uh, February 16th, 1965. And they found her near a storage shed behind the Heron Trading Estate. Acton, mm -hmm. which fuck man, that sucks to be found behind a storage shed. My thought is, if somebody's gonna kill me and dump my body, dump me somewhere cool. At least I don't want to be just laid out on the side of the street. Don't want to be behind a storage shed. Like I don't know. I'd be cool being found in the ocean somewhere. Just kind of like floating there with the fishies. That'd be cool. But anyway, back to Bridget. Um, she had been missing, obviously, since January 11th of 1965. Her body also turned up with flecks of industrial paint on her body, um, which they ended up tracing back to an electrical transformer near where her body was discovered. She also showed signs of being stored in a warm environment. So I'm assuming from that that she was killed. They didn't really want to dump her yet. So they stored her body for a little bit and then dropped her. Which, why murder somebody and then be like, oh, I'm just going to hold on to the corpse for a bit. Unless you're doing some weird stuff like sleeping with dead bodies and all of that, keep them nice and toasty. Which people do, it's pretty nasty. I know, there's a lot of people that, a lot of, actually, there's quite a few serial killers that kill their victims and either hold onto their bodies and sleep with them or like 
go and bury them and then re-dig them back up and then sleep with them and then bury them again. That, that just doesn't sound good to me. Like, if something's dead, I don't want to sleep with it. That's not sexy. That's not a turn on. Poor Bridget. I'm hoping that that's not what he was doing to you. But they said the transformer was a good fit for heating and storage and like the paint that was found on her body. Um, her cause of death was asphyxiation. And she was young too. She was 27 when she died. So all of these ladies were so young. But justice should be served. The only good thing I think that you can know from all of this is that like the dude who did it is dead. But at the same time, he still got to live a long life. Hopefully not too long, but he still got to live his life with like, being like, hey, I got to get away with murder. You know what, asshole? You should have died a long, slow death. So now we get into the investigation, right? And Chief Superintendent John Du Ross or John Du Ross of Scotland Yard, the detective put in charge of this case, he interviewed almost 7,000 suspects. Okay. He was in it. 7,000 suspects. And in the spring of 1965, the investigation in the murders encountered a major breakthrough when a sample of paint, which perfectly matched that uh, recovered on several of the victims found, concealed transformer at, I don't know, at the rear of a building of the Heron, 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 factory estate in Acton. Um, so mm. the factory estate faced a paint spray shop. Okay. So like you have the building and then you have a paint spray shop, which could actually have overspray. Just saying like you can have overspray. I'm just saying. So shortly thereafter, DeRose held a nose conference in which he falsely announced that the police had narrowed down the suspect pool to 20 men. And that by process of elimination, these suspects were being eliminated from investigation. That's just poor workmanship in my opinion. After a short period of time, he announced that the suspect pool um, contained only 10 members. And then only three. There were, from this point in time, no further Jack the Stripper killings following the initial news of this conference. I wonder why. I'll tell you my thoughts later, but like, why? Okay. So according to writer Anthony Summers, um, Hannah Telford and Francis Brown, the stripper's third and seventh victims, were preferably connected to the 1963 Profumo affair. Some victims additionally appearing in pornographic movies. Several writers have postulated that the victims may have known each other. There's no proof of this and that the killer may have connected to this scene as well. There is absolutely no proof of this whatsoever. And I mean whatsoever. There's no proof. Not even a little bit. Okay, 
well, that was disappointing and um, depressing to find like there was so much involved in this case. And then we get to the end of numerous lives affected, destroyed, ended due to one person's sickness, which it is a sickness to me, I think. Um, and just complete and total deviant behavior. And uh, this person will never probably ever come to light. We'll probably never know. This will go down in history like Jack the Ripper of maybe, possibly, we might have an idea. It's possible it's a, it's a police officer or a doctor or this. But we'll never know. We'll never know. And, and like this, you know, the, the poor gal whose head was accidentally decapitated. Most likely, she was also strangled um, and died of asphyxiation. But because of the damage done to her body, they're never, like, that's not ever going to be something that we know either. No. So. It's like none of these, none of these ladies are ever going to get a fair shot, a fair trial to really know what happened to them. No, I, they'll never have justice. No. And neither will the families no. of these victims. Like, they're going to forever be wondering if they're still around. Yeah. They'll forever be wondering, like, what happened to my daughter or my niece or, you know, my sister. Who did this? Yeah. Who did this and why? All because they're prostitutes? Like... In this, I don't really... I mean, it's possible that it was because they were prostitutes and he might have figured, like, in some cases that we'll be covering pretty soon, like the Times Square Killer in New York City. Um... You know, in the 70s, prostitutes were considered as non-human, literally. Yeah, well, and there's also some other serial killers that view them as just being dirty. Dirty. And so by getting them off the streets and destroying of them, they are cleaning up society. Yes. They are doing everybody a justice. Right. So, I mean, like, there's religious reasons. There's just moral, va you know, their, their moral value system or... Maybe it was their mother who was a prostitute, and by killing a prostitute, they're killing their mother. Um, you know, who really knows? But it is sad um, that this is one of those cases that there's no closure at all, and there never possibly ever will be. And I think that's probably the biggest crime here yeah. is, yes, their lives were lost and taken in a really horrible way, but the fact that the families are never going to get justice and these women will never see justice. Well, they'll never see it, but we will, you know. At least we know that a killer was no longer out there to be able to hurt other people this way. Yeah. Like, and I know there's always killers out there. Like, oh. we're never going to get away from serial killers or just bad people. They're always yeah. out there. But it's like, we can help to minimize it and at least get some of the really dangerous ones off the streets yeah, exactly. and make them actually like pay for the crimes that they've committed. Right. And who's to say that this person actually stopped? No, they could have continued to kill. They and just, just changed their MO. Yeah. Cause they saw that people were kind of getting close. Maybe, maybe they were because he stopped after that last, you know, that last press conference where they said that they were down to three. Yeah. And so he stopped. I think, like, that is a huge thing. But I think that he stopped doing it that way because it put the limelight on those people. Yeah. And then if they if he stopped doing it that way... It would change their direction and their where they were focusing all their energy. Yeah. He got smart. I think he got smart. I personally... So, like, when it comes down to, like, the Golden State um, serial rapist, right? Remember how he just stops? If I don't know if you know this, we will cover it, but not in the prostitution scheme of things because it doesn't cover... He's a good serial killer to cover. Well, he's not only a, a killer, he's a rapist. Yeah. And at first he was, I mean, just like, spoiler alert, but, like, at first he was... Um, just a burglar mm -hmm. and he burgled burgled he burglarized burgled. yes he burgled 
And that's all he did. And then he moved because he moved. And then he was like, well, this isn't good enough for me anymore. He wasn't getting that thrill that he was looking for. No. So he started raping then people. Then he started doing that. And then um, once a dentist basically said, um, you're not going to do this in my house. You know, that dentist and his wife were the next victims. Yeah. And then he started going after people who were married. So he burgled. And then he went after single women. And, and then he went after couples. He went after couples. And um, then finally he ended up killing people. This went on a span for a very long time. And then one day he stopped. Which is weird. He got married and he had, he had girls. Yeah, which will change. It'll change your outlook on a lot of things, but it doesn't for all of them because there have been quite a few serial killers that were also rapists that were married had children, children and continued to do what they did. Yes. And I don't... I, I, I can't say in my opinion on that that he actually changed his mind. I... I you think that thrill or whatever was still there? Yeah, I do. I think it was still there. And I, I think that maybe the possibility that he was actually married and maybe getting caught was just too embarrassing for him. Like maybe he just didn't want his family to know that that's the type of person that he was. And maybe that's why he's, I don't know. Yeah, it could be. But I mean, he stopped, literally. <laughs> he never committed another crime. And <clears throat> then was caught as this old fucking man. But I'm, I'm also wondering though too, if like the sexual thrill of it was done was done and like when he got married like his wife and family were able to fulfill that need maybe. that he was out there searching for maybe possibly i mean and, and and maybe in this instance for jack the stripper you know my feelings are that i think he was younger um i don't feel like he was a person in his 40s I think he was probably late 20s, maybe 27. And then maybe he actually ended up getting into a relationship and he got married and then he just no longer looked at prostitutes anymore. You know, I mean, maybe yeah. also they denied him. Maybe they told him no. Maybe he had a small member and they laughed at him. And that's why he and decided that's to kill why, them. Yes, I mean, like, yeah, there's, there's, tons of reasons. there's so many things here. But anyway... That's the story of Jack the Stripper, not to be confused with Jack the Ripper, who was, you know, disemboweling and um, m numerous other horrible things that I have covered in previous episodes. So if you haven't seen that, go back, take a listen. It is a fucking mind blower. And yeah, so that's the end of this. But you know what? Side note, I wonder if Jack the Stripper was a stripper. <laughs> Plot twist. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun. That... It would almost make more sense to me it, 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 if the girls had been strippers. Yeah. To name him Jack, Jack the, the stripper. stripper. Yeah, like how do you get that name? Cause... Because he took their clothes off. I mean, I know. That's... A lot of people take... Like if you're, if you're... But I'm wondering if he was raping these women too or was he just killing them? Well, see, here's why they say, in my opinion, going back and reading all of this and, and, and the things that I've watched on this, is that these women were prostitutes and they had been working the night that they were killed. So it, it, it's not conclusive to say that he had not had sex with, with them. them. yeah. Because that would be... That he didn't, like, violently rape them. Yeah. But he could have had sex with them. And then killed them after. And then killed them. Yeah. But to say that they were actually, like, assaulted in that manner... It's tough to know. How can we say? We didn't. Yeah. And th I think that's why they never say that he actually sexually assaulted them. Because they were working girls. And they had been working the night of their, of their deaths. And they had had sex with God knows how many people. Yeah. And when he was their last John. Yeah. Cause he picked them up. Yeah. They willingly went with him. They did. 
So did they have sex or not? Only those two will ever know. That's right. You know? Well, anyway, guys. So I hope that you have enjoyed this episode. I always love having this girl with me. Makes my day. Um, it's always a process. <laughs> let me tell you. But, but it's, it's so a, much fun. It's a fun process. It is. I just love it. Um, so if you like what I and we are doing here, do me and us the great, great favor of subscribing. Please leave me and us your messages. We will both reply to you, please, every night, as always. And we will see you next time. Bye, guys. Bye.